Hello and welcome to this uh, edition of uh, an ORF discussion uh, with leading experts from Sri Lanka uh, and uh, from India. Uh, we are going to discuss uh, the crisis which uh, Sri Lanka is facing right now. It is an economic crisis, but there is a very uh, uh, strong political dimension to this crisis. Uh, and, uh, and, and frankly speaking, uh, the title of this particular uh, show is that when all hell breaks loose, and in some ways we've seen the uh, hell break loose in Sri Lanka. Uh, so it's going to be a tough ride for Sri Lanka coming out of this uh, particular crisis, but other countries have been in such crises in the past and have come out of it. Uh, so there's no reason why Sri Lanka should not be able to do it. Uh, but we have a fabulous uh, panel of experts out here uh, to shed more light on what is happening. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Rehana uh, uh, Taufik, uh, who is an economist. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Sanjana Hatotua. Uh, he is a research fellow at the Disinformation Project uh, in New Zealand. Uh, and he's been a former editor as well. Uh, we have uh, Ambika uh, Satkunathan, uh, who uh, is a fellow with the Open Society Foundation uh, and is a former commissioner of Human Rights Commission of Sri Lanka. And uh, last but not the least, we have Ambassador Alok Prasad, a former diplomat uh, who has served as High Commissioner to Sri Lanka and uh, as Deputy National Security Advisor and currently is the non-executive chairman of the Bauer Group Asia. Uh, so, uh, so I, 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 because the economy is the real crisis right now, let me just start with uh, Rehana. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to delve so much on uh, how Sri Lanka has reached this pass because this crisis has been a kind of a slow burn over many years, uh, decades, in fact. Uh, and it's always been avoided until now. Uh, and it's been a combination of bad luck and some bad policies. But the question now is that uh, how does Sri Lanka get out of the crisis uh, which it finds itself in? And frankly, uh, while uh, you know sitting outside Sri Lanka, we saw uh, what are the, the scenes play out on the streets. We, uh, we've read a lot about the crisis. Uh, but for me, at least, it was Prime Minister Vikramasinghe's statement yesterday, uh, which sounded almost like an apocalypse visiting Sri Lanka. Uh, so, uh, from in many ways, it looks like uh, you know he's taken on Mission Impossible. But from your perch, Sri Rehana, how do you look at what the situation currently is, and what is the possible way out? Um, thank you for having me. And I just want to say I'm not a doctor, so just miss this fine. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, you're absolutely right. The economic meltdown has been a slow burn. Uh, we can trace the, 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 the debt uh, crisis down to what we call the twin deficit problem. So that's a structural problem in the economy that uh, Sri Lanka has for many years run uh, a current account deficit as well as a fiscal deficit. Uh, over the, uh, especially post-war period, we saw uh, an exponential growth in the fiscal uh, fiscal deficit. And, uh, you know, subsequent governments failed to address the structural problems around, uh, you know, trade policy and export orientation. Um, I think, uh, it, I think like, um, until March, uh, the end of March, the government was uh, absolutely refusing to uh, seek out an IMF program. Uh, there was a lot of uh, hub hubris and uh, false bravado uh, on the from the government uh, officials uh, and the politicians. Um, so now we have, uh, I mean, it doesn't make sense to talk about long-term uh, economic reforms right now because uh, Sri Lankan economy is uh, absolutely spiraling out of control. Uh, so the, the main thing that has to be done is to uh, stabilize uh, the economy immediately. Um, and we, uh, you know, I, I, we did see the new central bank governor take uh, some measures by increasing uh, policy rates uh, uh, so that the government can borrow from the domestic market. And also uh, it, it goes 
uh, some extent to mitigating inflation as well. Um, the other main issue is that Sri Lanka has been has struggled to uh, you know really finalize uh, or get much bridge financing. Uh, we did get some support from India uh, some time ago, and uh, they are in the discussions right now as well. But we we have run our reserves down to uh, absolutely nothing. Um, just yesterday, the prime minister said that uh, we don't even have the, uh, the government can't even scrape together one million dollars, right? So we are in a very precarious situation, and bridge financing is uh, the, the key to, I think, stabilizing the the economy in the short uh, short term. But in the longer term, then you have to take you have to undertake the reforms to address those structural problems. You have to address uh, why is the fiscal why why does Sri Lanka have such a fiscal uh, high fiscal deficit? There's very high uh, there, there's very low uh, tax collection, so you have to uh, you have to address that problem. Then you have to look at, uh, you know, uh, trade liberalization. How do you uh, how do you orient uh, the economy towards a more export, uh, you know, outward looking, uh, you know, uh, front? And so those those issues have to be addressed. But I think right now the key is to stabilize the economy. Uh, Rihanna, the question, however, is I understand that the immediate crisis, you know, the immediate stabilization is required, and then you know there is the short term. Kind of policies which need to be undertaken and the longer term ones. But very often we have observed that when countries get into a crisis, they take all the short term measures which are required to come out of, you know, or at least stabilize themselves some. Uh, they get whatever assistance is required and then, uh, and then they go off to sleep. And the necessary reform and the structural adjustments which really need to be made are never made, and the next crisis is often worse than the previous one. Uh, now, to my mind, the current situation in Sri Lanka uh, might be a very, you know, uh, appropriate time uh, to do some of those big bang reforms. I know I, it's easier for me, you know, sitting in my room uh, prescribing uh, these kind of reforms, and much more difficult if you are a politician who has to actually undertake these reforms. But don't you think that, uh, you know, uh, if, if this opportunity is simply because politicians being politicians will never want to take those reforms, which are going to administer bitter medicine. So uh, in your view, don't you think it makes a lot more sense to carry out both the short and the long term reforms parallelly rather than sequentially? Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, they say you shouldn't let a food crisis go to waste, right? So um, uh, the thing is, Sri Lanka has never been in a crisis of this sort before. Uh, so I don't I don't know how appropriate it is to compare to how Sri Lanka has been in the past. I mean, yes, uh, several governments have you know shied away from doing the hard reforms. Uh, but now, uh, for example, you could take the, uh, the fuel prices, which has been uh, revised like almost three times uh, to from what it was. Uh, so there is talks of bringing in uh, market-based pricing. Uh, and then uh, yesterday, the PM speech, he spoke about uh, privatizing Sri Lankan airlines. So the discussions are ongoing. And uh, I think, yes, we shouldn't wait until we are in a comfortable, uh, a too comfortable place uh, to undertake the, these hard reforms. But uh, given the situation of Sri Lanka, I don't think we'll be able to come out of, uh, out of this crisis unless we uh, actually do the hard reforms. I mean, I can't talk about the political aspect of it because, I mean, I'm not a politician and I understand uh, sometimes it can be difficult, uh, you know, in terms of... Uh, you know, maintaining your political leverage. But now it looks like we are in a situation where the public is rejecting all political parties almost. So nobody has any political capital left, it almost looks like. So uh, one final uh, question before I go to Ambika, Rihanna, because um, so you know, one knows that some of these uh, you know, new policies are going to come into place. But... Uh, the real question which I think everybody needs to be asking is who is going to bear the cost of the adjustment process? Because given the fact that, uh, you know, and you yourself mentioned that uh, there is not enough taxation, revenues are low, expenditure is very high. 
pay, subsidies are very high, going through the roof. Uh, and, and very often we've seen that when these processes take place, uh, you know, the, the overwhelming burden is on people who really can't afford uh, the, the cost of this adjustment. Uh, will it be the same in Sri Lanka or will it, do you think it will be something different? Uh, will the rich be made to uh, pay taxes through their nose or uh, will the will the brunt of the adjustment again fall upon uh, the not so well to do in Sri Lanka? Uh, so we are yet to see what exactly the tax reforms will be. Uh, one tax that come into place is the surcharge tax, which is uh, levying uh, sort of a retrospective tax on the profits by some uh, 65 companies which made a lot of profit in the 2021 period. Um, now, I'm not saying that that's, you know, suddenly going to make Sri Lanka very, uh, deliver a very progressive tax structure, but there are also discussions going on about what kind of safety nets need to be put in place to make sure that um, that the poor and the vulnerable who, as you say, are going to be the worst hit, uh, you know, and don't end up uh, bearing a much of that brunt. So I think uh, like uh, removing the full subsidy, for example, which is en enjoyed for the most part by the rich people because they are the ones who consume most of it. Uh, so stuff, uh, you know, that is going to go a long way in terms of also increasing the cost for the poor people. But then you have to collect, uh, you know, you have to collect the finances and then you have to funnel it towards the poor people. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. I'm not saying that we are going to, you know, achieve 100% success and that every poor person is going to be protected. But, uh, you know, that's the, that's the situation we are in right now. Uh, Ambika, you know, we've, we've seen uh, the economic meltdown and we've seen the impact of that economic meltdown on the streets uh, of Colombo and some of the other cities. Uh, we've seen the kind of violence which, uh, you know, one normally did not really associate uh, at least the street violence in Sri Lanka, although it's happened in the past on a couple of occasions, but uh, we thought uh, this was not going to happen again. Um, and what we have seen, uh, at least in this latest round of violence, is the sharp divide and clashes between the extreme left and the extreme right in uh, Sri Lanka. Because some of the reports suggest that much of the street violence was by the extreme left groups like JVP and others. Uh, and, and there was retaliation from the extreme right side or the extreme right started it and whatever. That, the dynamics are not important. But do you think that this uh, left and right kind of uh, polarization, which uh, is now being seen in Sri Lanka, uh, do you think that this crisis can bridge it? Or do you sense that this will actually exacerbate this divide even further? Well, firstly, I don't think that we should uh, describe it as extreme left and extreme right, because where the protests are concerned, particularly go gota gamma golf phase, uh, the JVP affiliated groups were there. Um, there were student groups, but there are also various other groups. It is very diverse. And I don't think anyone can claim that space or anyone can say that is an extreme left space or people there hold extreme left ideologies because uh, there are people there who are protesting for the very first time who don't have much political literacy, but who just want things to change, who don't like things the way they are. So I don't think that is a correct way to um, frame it because it's more, these protests are very important because of the fact that they are not politically party driven. They are not trade union driven. And in large part, they are citizens coming together, which is why different groups might also be demanding different things. There is only one demand that all of them have, which is that the president and his family should go home. The other demands that I see are common amongst all different groups because, you know, you, you have people protesting, asking for uh, fuel and gas and kerosene, they don't care much about the executive presidency necessarily, right? So it is more perhaps the urban groups, the young people who are at Bogota Gama uh, in golf face who would be demanding that. So therefore, there is a lot of uh, diversity and um, 
it's we need to find a, um, another way of uh, describing it. So what I would say here, it is the state versus the citizen is what I would say. And what we have seen is an authoritarian violent state basically behaving as it always has. We have seen differences uh, between regimes because during some regimes, some governments, like during the good governance government, it diminishes a lot. Uh, the complaints of torture diminish, but they don't ever go away. They diminish also because you had independent uh, institutions like perhaps, you know, the Human Rights Commission. And what we saw was uh, government uh, allied uh, individuals, people of their party, people holding public positions who engaged in violence against peaceful protesters. So that is what happened at Ballface. The prime minister seemed to have an indication of it. His son seemed to have an indication of it because they first went there and they said they were coming to Ballface before they did. But they took, the prime minister of the time took absolutely no uh, action to prevent them. The police were standing there. We have video evidence of the police just allowing them to come, not preventing the violence, standing by by the violence took place. So that is the first part of it, as I see. The second part of it is the counter violence. Now, that also seems to be quite complicated. It is some people say it's JVP. It is another political group. Not so easy because the evidence emerging says that in some uh, cases, it was the local communities who were angry with the person. In other cases, it was internal party rivalry. So it is it is varied, as we see. It is complicated and it is varied. In one case, we see the military standing there where people are attacking a house. So what is that? So it, <laughs> But what it shows is it's an unaccountable state and a government that came to power claiming to be a law and order government, but that uses violence to create chaos and insecurity when it suits it to remain in power. Um, that, that is how I would characterize what happened. And what we're seeing now is mass arrests. We have seen more than 200, 230 persons who have been arrested for the counter violence, mind you. But many of these people are journalists they're civic activists, they're trade unionists. They have been arrested not based on evidence or even reasonable suspicion. It seems like they are being targeted. So they are not enjoying their due process rights. Where the violence against the protesters is concerned, no arrests have been made. The IGP has said, or, or the sorry, the attorney general has said, if there is evidence, sufficient evidence, then arrest and has given a list. Now, that is due process. If there is sufficient evidence, you must arrest. But why didn't they follow the same rule with the 238 persons they arrested supposedly for anti-government violence? So that's how I would characterize what took place, the violence. And uh, tell me, uh, there are some rumors, uh, and I don't know how credible those rumors are, <clears throat> but there is some talk that uh, some of this, if, if these kind of disturbances continue, uh, there will be an impact on uh, the ethnic and the minority politics in Sri Lanka as well. Uh, that there is growing restiveness, for example, among the Tamil uh, minority in Sri Lanka. There is some talk uh, of uh, a refugee crisis coming India's way because of the economic crisis. Uh, but uh, what are you sensing on the ground? Uh, I believe, you, you know, before we started, you were saying you are in Mulaitavu. So what since you are on, in a sense, ground zero, what what is the kind of, uh, with your ear to the ground, what are you getting? What is the feedback? Well, I would say where, the, you know, it's a good question because where the Tamils are concerned, particularly the Tamils in the north and the east, they have been demonstrating and protesting against this government and the president in particular for a long time. <coughs> Sorry. For several years, the families that disappeared have been doing so peaceful protests continuously for more than 1,900 days. That protest has not received any uh, visibility in the South or even in international media. So I don't think the Tamils are restive and this is making them, uh, you know, uh, rise up, etc. Not at all. If at all, the Tamils were not actually participating actively in these general protests for many reasons. One is that they felt they have been 
protesting for a long time that has not received solidarity support or visibility. The other is they are afraid that if they protest, there will be reprisals against them because they're used to that. And also because they feel like we've been struggling for so long fighting against this regime. Now, guys, it's your turn. Take it forward. So it's, it's a combination of several factors. But what we did see was this government just, you know, usual um, MO, what it did was... Um, the day after the violence, it tried to use that to incite anti-Muslim violence, you know, bring conflict between the Catholics and the Muslims in a particular locality. The local community leaders stepped up, the priests stepped up, and they diffused it. And it was very clearly someone who was affiliated to this regime who tried to make this into an, uh, a communal or interreligious um, violence. Uh, therefore, I don't think this generally what is creating insecurity is the what the state or what the government has done. For instance, it declared a state of emergency, which allowed it to issue emergency regulations, which restrict human rights. Uh, now, the funny thing is, while the state of emergency existed that gives additional powers to the military, somehow all these people went to go, go, Tagama and attacked, attacked all the peaceful protesters. So why did they have a state of emergency? So what we come back to again repeatedly is the government here. Uh, that is using laws, abusing laws, creating insecurity, cre trying to create inter, uh, uh, intercommunal or inter-religious uh, conflict, all in its quest to remain in power. So, uh, which brings us to the larger political question, which is that, uh, you know, you have a new prime minister in Ranil Vikramasinghe. Uh, but he is either uh, an extremely brave man to take on the mantle at this point in time or uh, just simply extremely ambitious. But the fact that he has just a single seat in parliament, he doesn't have a whole lot of political capital behind him. How does he deliver on, uh, you know, he made a very fighting speech uh, or a statement yesterday. But how does he deliver, uh, you know, because without the politics, getting the politics right, getting people together to back whatever reform measures have to be taken, uh, there is no way you can push it through. And if he goes and you have, you know, this Game of Thrones playing out in Colombo, uh, where people are constantly uh, upstaging their political rivals to grab power, uh, perhaps stay for just a couple of weeks, couple of months in power, uh, that creates even greater political uncertainty and uh, prevents the kind of decisions which require to be taken to pull the economy out. How does the politics play out now, in your view? Yeah, um, well, what we've been given is Hobson's choice here because the president has had various uh, options. <clears throat> the president chose not to take those options. Uh, which was for him to resign. There were other parties, including the main opposition, that had made conditional offers. He chose not to take it. He had made the offer to Ranil Vikramasinghe, who came with no conditions. So the question, and this is something I tweeted the other day, what would have happened if Ranil Vikramasinghe had not taken the offer, right? So right now, we, when Ranil Vikramasinghe was appointed, there were others, you know, pragmatists who were saying, okay, now he's been appointed, uh, we need to all be silent and let him get on with the job. But what people were saying is this is also horse trading. This is the corrosive, dysfunctional political culture. And we cannot trust him also because he was brought in solely to save the Rajapaksas and to uh, ensure that they stay in power. And what we have seen since then today is an illustration of that because they had... Um, they proposed, you know, deputy speaker. It was the prime minister who said we should put forward a woman. The SJB put forward a woman as deputy speaker. It was understood that the SLPP, the you know, the president's party, that they had agreed to it and there would even be no vote, that she would be elected by consensus. Well, what do you see? 
the SLPP feels their own candidate and they vote for it. And this is supposed that many independents who broke away from the SLPP also vote for it. So the female candidate stands defeated, right? And so this was understood that the prime minister had actually got agreement on this. He clearly didn't. Then we had the motion. Uh, to express displeasure or dissatisfaction with the, with the president. There was a vote to ask that the standing orders be suspended in order for this to be taken up <clears throat> before the adjournment debate. But once again, when that was called for a vote, uh, they voted against it. It was defeated. And of course, the prime minister also voted against it. And then he, his uh, justification was it is that the, the opposition did not understand parliamentary procedure and they were trying to subvert it and they were not being strategic. All goes to show that the SLPP still has power. It appears the prime minister does not have power. And although they talk about a consensus or a national government, unity government, multi-party government, what the Rajapaksas want is not that. And they're not going to give that. What they want is to manipulate the situation to remain in power. So it's actually very worrying because they are not going to let go of their grip on power. We have a prime minister who appears to be in cahoots with them. Uh, and we now see at least at least now we see the main opposition trying to make some effort, like one of them said that he will be on the public finance committee of parliament because he doesn't want portfolios, but he wants to uh, assist the recovery process. So it appears that the main opposition finally is making some effort. But if the Rajapaksas do not yield and if the the prime minister continues to enable them, it's a very relevant question for everyone. Uh, not just for the citizens, but for the IMF, for international community, as to what is what are the options that we have. Uh, so that's where we are. It's, a, it's a, as I said, Hobson's choice, and I don't know whether it's even a choice that we have now. So, uh, so Sanjana, one of the things which a lot of people uh, did mention before Ranel became the prime minister was that uh, the leadership in Sri Lanka has never spoken truth to the people. Uh, his statement yesterday, uh, I think, spoke the truth, but uh, spoke a very, very harsh truth to the people. Uh, but I wonder, one, how that will be received in the country. Uh, and secondly, how do you think it will be uh, seen you know, uh, around the world, especially by the market, especially by economic players, uh, I'm sure many of them would know what exactly the kind of dire straits Sri Lanka finds itself in. But perceptually, uh, how do you think this is likely to play out? Do you think uh, his being honest uh, will work? Uh, or do you think uh, they'll have to do something more to make it work? Maybe Rehana can take the market question and I'll talk about public and, you know, a general, yeah. Yeah, uh, I think uh, like, for for people who've been observing the economic uh, situation from uh, say an academic or a market-based perspective i don't think uh, the prime minister's message yesterday was uh, as shocking as it would be to someone who was not aware of the situation because we knew that uh, you know just actually last week um, we were told that the reserves were about 5 million dollars and now yesterday we were told that they can't even scrape together a million dollars. So it's not really uh, that shocking. Um, as for, uh, you know, the, the, le the, the legitimacy of uh, Ranil Vikramasinghe, I think he does have, uh, he's on a better leg in terms of, you know, going out to, uh, you know, for discussions with the IMF or for discussions with other with Western governments and with other, you know, the Indian and the uh, Chinese governments or whoever is willing to help us. I think he is in a better situation or a better standing than the Rajapaksha government. Um, but I don't know if he has the, uh, the, the political legitimacy among the public in Sri Lanka. Um, I know that there was, uh, you know, a certain level of, uh, you know, so, so, sort of like a, a gratitude for the, the honesty yesterday. But I don't know if, uh, you know, on the ground, 
uh, you know, yeah, sure, I can ex- I can sort of appreciate the honesty, but I don't know if that's what people really want, and I don't know if he's really offering um, uh, the people what they really want, which is uh, they want a political solution more uh, before they want economic solutions. Ambika, over to you. Thanks. Um, I I think <clears throat> generally. Yes, politicians uh, in Sri Lanka do not tell the public the truth. And um, therefore, this was, I saw, you know, said that refreshing, whatnot. But I think maybe that's also the the more the urban population. We don't know how it has filtered down to the rural population and how they take this. Uh, like, for instance, in the north and the east, I think it's like barely had like a you know uh in that sense it was like oh right um but he doesn't have legitimacy but at the same time you did see for instance uh the as i you know pragmatist saying now he's here you'd have to let him do the job he's super competent so we should not talk about the reforms we can talk about all this later but in my experience of working on these issues for quite a long time I can say that the never the later never comes so the later is now the moment is now particularly because there is a lot of uh public civic awakening or the the public uh beginning to understand what the uh, civic responsibility is. That is extremely important. Uh, where the international community is concerned, I think to an extent, yes, they were quite relieved when he was appointed because rather than dealing with the Raj boxes, yes, he's someone they can deal with. They felt he was competent. But I think perhaps, you know, whether it was Ranil or whether it was Sajith and SJB, I don't know whether there would have been a huge difference in how they uh, reacted. But, but how the public viewed it is that they viewed the international community's endorsement of uh, Ranil Vikramasinghe as sort of a betrayal, or they felt that the international community was also saying no need for reforms now, no need uh, to demand that the Gotabe Rajapaksa step down, no need to abolish the executive presidency, let's just stabilize things. Yes, we do need to stabilize the economy, but it's not um, you know, mutually exclusive. Uh, so I think that's the general mood here, but the general mood I think is more anxiety, anger and confusion than anything else. And I don't think bringing Ranil Vikramasinghe has exactly resolved that. Uh, Ambassador Prasad, if I can just turn to you, sir. Uh, you know, over the last couple of months, uh, the the numbers uh, which are being thrown about is that India has already given roughly around three point five billion dollars worth of assistance to Sri Lanka to tide over the crisis. Uh, that assistance con- continues to flow uh, as we speak. Uh, India has also promised uh, you know to do whatever else it can, but clearly there are certain limitations and constraints that we have of our own. Uh, how do you see uh, India handle the situation and what more do you think India can do uh, to try and assist Sri Lanka out of this crisis? Well, first of all, um, let me say that, you know, what is happening in Sri Lanka uh, is, is uh, a great sadness and distress in India, you know, to see another neighbor, friendly neighbor with whom we have had such you know, uh, close cultural historical ties to um, descend into this kind of chaos, uh, chaos is, is very uh, distressing in India. Now, and these are not just words because, you know, as you mentioned that almost as a first responder, I think India in this crisis has done more than any other country. And uh, the amount is about 3.5 billion just over the current crisis in various forms in our lines of credit, currency swaps, etc. If the lights are on in Colombo, even for eight or ten hours a day, it's because of the shipments coming in from India. And yesterday, Prime Minister running Vikram Singh uh, said that there was one day spectral left, but there are two shipments. From, in, from the Indian line of credit on their way. So 
you know, that is enabling Sri Lanka to tide over the situation. But clearly, I mean, India cannot bail Sri Lanka out completely. And there are international institutions which are meant precisely for that. I mean, namely the IMF. And I don't think there is any alternative to uh, Sri Lanka going and restructuring its debt uh, through the IMF, with an IMF uh, standby program. And there too, India represents Sri Lanka on the executive board of the IMF, and we have promised all assistance to, you know, work with other board members to uh, see that a uh, you know, acceptable program is evolved. So. Hopefully that will uh, be the way forward. But I must say that it is going to be very difficult for Sri Lanka. It's not that you go to the IMF and you get things restructured and things bounce back. Yes, some countries have come back, India itself, after 1991. But many others have not. And it also comes with a lot of pain because the IMF will impose very tough conditionalities. And that will be up to Mr. Vikram Singhe, how he communicates that, how much more pain the Sri Lankan people uh, are continuing to take, because we know some of these standard things, that subsidies will have to be cut, the fiscal deficit will have to be reduced, some of the spending uh, will have to go, some of the tax rates will have to be increased, uh, probably petrol, Diesel prices will have to be increased further, you know, things of that nature. And uh, so it's going to be a very, very difficult time uh, for Sri Lanka. And uh, obviously, India will try and do whatever we can, as we have been doing. But uh, I think it's going to be difficult for Sri Lanka to navigate through this process. But Ambassador Prasad, uh, see, I, I completely understand that, uh, you know, the IMF. Uh, part of the problem is that countries don't follow through with all IMF prescriptions and then slide uh, out of the crisis out of which they've come. We've seen that, in, for example, in Pakistan on multiple occasions. Um, and, and there is a certain political angle to the IMF assistance as well. Uh, you know, they, they sometimes give certain leeway to countries. In other cases, uh, they, they uh, don't cut any slack. Uh, but if you are not going to through with that adjustment process, then I don't see what else is important because given the kind of situation that currently prevails, uh, if you are not going to be ready to adjust, then other countries can turn around and say that, look, uh, why should I spend my money on Sri Lanka uh, when the Sri Lankans themselves are not ready to make the necessary sacrifices? How does that work out, sir? No, there is no other way out. I mean, I started by this. Sri Lanka is already in default. It can't raise any money in, in the in the international market. There is a limit to what you know, neighbors or friends or other friendly countries can do. So it will have to go to the IMF. What I am saying is that the IMF adjustment program is also not going to be very smooth and easy. Uh, for Sri Lanka, and therefore there will be a protracted uh, sort of economic crisis for some time to come. But sir, do you think uh, this crisis in Sri Lanka might also be an opportunity? For example, uh, you know, we, we, we are now moving into the realm of geopolitics, uh, geostrategy, um, and of course the C word uh, comes into the play. Uh, that this is a this is an opportunity for countries like India, the Quad countries, uh, perhaps EU, uh, to come together to try and uh, you know uh, assist Sri Lanka uh, and perhaps keep the Chinese out. Do you think uh, something like this could become a motivating factor for getting in for India playing a role in getting the support of other countries to assist Sri Lanka? Yeah, I'm sure some of that will happen, but I think the gateway for that is the IMF adjustment program. I don't think anybody will be willing to, you know, sink money or put in more money into Sri Lanka unless they see that happening and they see a structured, you know, program of recovery worked out with the IMF. Then, yes, some countries, as India already has, 
uh, you know, come in with bridging finance or to, uh, you know, help Sri Lanka drive over uh, this problem in the, in the near term. But, you know, I also want to make a, a different point, and that is that, you know, in a sense, we are, we are working in two parallel universes. You know, I mean, you, if you look at the, um, the street protests and what the people are saying, and uh, you know, the 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 amount of uh, uh, pain and distress and unhappiness that they are expressing, there seems to be a disconnect with the political class in Sri Lanka. I mean, even the principal opposition, the SGV, has taken. Such a nuanced position that I think nobody understands exactly what they mean. It says, you know, saying that, yes, the president must go, but we will give him time. It is for him to fix a time frame. We are not in favor of executive presidency, but this can't be done. And to my mind, I think dealing with this issue of the executive presidency is at the heart of the political process. I mean, because it's it's the sort of source of the centralization of power and you know the misuse of power which you know in a sense has led to this situation. So that has to be dealt with, but I don't see a political path. I mean now we have Mr. Rani Vikram Singhal, who is going to be dependent on the president's party. The president's party has, I think the president has made it very clear that he is not going to go anywhere. Um, they all say, you know, theoretically that they are in uh, favor of abolishing the executive presidency, but, uh, you know, it has never happened. And people say that when they're close to the end of their second term. We heard that both from um, Chandika Kumarutanu as well as, you know, Mr. Mahindra Rajapaksa himself. But, you know, those are the sorts of issues that would need to be dealt with. And I, I don't see the political class coming to grips with, uh, you know, some of these issues as we are seeing being reflected uh, by the people and the unhappiness being expressed by the people. And I'm not, e not even mentioning right now the national question as it is called in Sri Lanka, this whole business of what kind of, you know, arrangement they uh, enter with the Tamil, uh, because I think that is not on anybody's agenda at the moment. Hopefully at some point it will be addressed. But right now, I think things will just come around to, you know, let's deal with this crisis and all other issues. Uh, we will, we will uh, see about them later. I think that's probably what is going to happen. Sanjana, let me, uh, let me try something else. Uh, and this time on the media. Uh, we've seen uh, that should work for you. Because we've seen... Uh, we've seen that the Sri Lankan media has been somewhat controlled uh, in in the in many years now, um, and 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 journalists have been harassed when they've been you know chasing stories, uh, uncomfortable stories. Uh, but like in other parts of the world, we have seen an explosion of social media. I'm sure the same phenomena exists pretty much in Sri Lanka as well. Now, Ambassador Prasad spoke about you know, this disconnect, which he sees at one level, at the political level, but what the people are saying, uh, uh, you know, is, and I'm sure you are monitoring what is happening on the social media scene. Uh, what is it that you are picking up? What are the kind of views that are being expressed? Uh, what is the kind of uh, outrage, hope, despondency? What is it that you are picking up? That's a good question. Um, it is unlike anything that the country has seen. I've been studying this since January 2010, and the evolution of social media has been entwined with, almost umbilically connected to the instrumentalization of social media in the country. And as far back as 2012, we saw that the, uh, the Budubala Sena, um, which is a uh, militant Buddhist organization in parallel to what was happening in Myanmar was instrumentalizing Facebook to spread hate, hurt, and harm in the country. And since then, from the general elections of 2015 through to then the elections 
since then, we have seen one family in the country that's primus inter pares, and those are the Rajapaksas. Anything done to weaponize social media, anything done to instrumentalize it for any kind of uh, uh, thing that is detrimental to democracy, they've done. Uh, and so uh, the question is an interesting one because this is the first time, the first moment that we've seen a critical questioning of some of those narratives uh, as part of the protest movement as well. So I want to go back to something that Ambika said, which is that it's not easy to define what's happening because it is complicated. And that's actually a good thing. It's not easily uh, explained away by uh, refer uh, referring to parties or to civil society or to institutions or to even individuals. The Gota Go Home uh, movement and the GGG at Goldface are, uh, are things, are, are, are physical uh, geographic spaces that are unlike anything that we've seen and that is represented on social media as well. So let's go by the numbers. And that's that's one extraordinary way of looking at it. So just with the two hashtags that I'm monitoring, Gota Go Home and Go Home Gota, there have been about 3,500 tweets a day since the 27th of March. That is extraordinary. Um, I look at about 450, what I call junk news pages. They're basically gossip pages. But in to cut a long story short, in Sri Lanka, um, those are the pages that communicate political news and very often partisan news as well, particularly during electoral moments. And so a lot of Sri Lankans get their political awareness and particularly during the protest movement as well from these pages. And around 450 of them, uh, I monitor about 450 mean pages and around 100 singular news pages on, on Facebook belonging to the mainstream media. The numbers are quite extraordinary. And remember, keep in mind that Ambika's problems in connecting are representative of the country writ large. So these numbers are in a country where the telco towers simply are struggling to keep, keep uh, connectivity alive in light of the uh, prolonged power cuts. So the numbers in April are staggering in that regard. So just with the cluster of the gossip uh, meme and singular news pages, we saw around 97 million interactions just on Facebook pages and around 807 million video views over April alone. Um, now, uh, the highest month-on-month -month increase in interactions has been over March to April, ever, on Facebook in the country. The highest ever day-on-day -day increase in interactions was from the 8th of May to the 9th of May, or say the 9th of May to the 10th of May. The 9th of May saw the violence that we are talking about, and Ambika and Rehana have both referred to, uh, in terms of what Mahindra Rajpaks uh, instigated against the peaceful protesters at Golface, that saw the highest historical increase in engagement across TikTok, Facebook, and uh, Facebook groups and Instagram in the country since those platforms were introduced to the country. I also look at about 975 pages on Facebook that have been talking about the protest movement, uh, looking at uh, several hashtags in Singhala, as well as several hashtags in English. I mean, just a way of trying to determine what pages are talking about, which kind of content. And so these pages are promoting the protest. They are interrogating, they are, they are, they are, they are putting out uh, the, uh, the call for the president to resign. And they are focusing on what is happening both at Golfist, but keep in mind, and just so that the viewers know, it's not just in Golfist that these protests are occurring. They're happening in Kandy, in the South, in the East, um, and in the middle of the country as well. Those 975 pages resulted in 1.6 billion interactions just over April. And from 27th March up until yesterday, 2.7 billion views, billion. So these are numbers that we haven't really talked about or studied. I mean, I did my doctoral research on social media in the country from 2018 to 2020, and it's nothing like what we've seen in any of those crises points uh, in March 2018 during the anti-Muslim violence, the 52-day constitutional crisis from October to December 2018, the Easter Sunday violence in April 2019, and then the presidential election in 2019, November. So it's nothing remotely approximating those numbers. Uh, Singhala news subscriptions on Facebook has grown in the past month alone by 1.2 million uh, followers. And parliament, I mean, as a Democrat, I think we can celebrate in the fact that parliament has seen uh, around 25,000 people join its page. I mean, it's a small number, 
but these are good signs that people are really interested in determining um, the degree to which what the protests want and what the protesters want, which is a clarion call, whether it's been reflected in parliamentary proceedings and the simple answer, it's not, but then you have that contestation uh, as well. And finally, one of the things I'll end by saying is that again, historically unprecedented reductions in followers of the president, the prime minister, Mr. Namal Rajapaksa, who's the minister of everything in the country uh, and a leading disinformation producer who's been very close to the family. So the president has over since 27th March, when again, this is the first president in the history of our country, the first politician in the history of our country who stopped commentary on his Facebook page late March and hasn't opened it since. Um, he's lost 30,000 followers. The prime minister has lost 11,000 followers. Mr. Nama Rajabaksa has lost 9.2 thousand followers. And that disinformation for a producer who's well known as a, as a singer in the country has lost around 44,000 followers. The, the loss is significant. The loss signifies that the protest is having an impact in the way that people are critically questioning what Ambika talked about, which is the constant everyday campaign to instigate hate, hurt and harm, communal division, violence on the ground, disinformation on social media to a degree that crisis is the brand of the Rajapaksas. And so uh, 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 nearly uh, over a decade's worth of investments in instrumentalizing social media to prop up the family and to prop up the regime, uh, even when they were in the hiatus during the Hapalna administration, when they weren't in power, has now failed. And that's not anything that we've seen before. And that is simply on account of the organic growth of an appeal around the content that is being produced at significant pace every day since the 27th of March around the protests in Sri Lanka. So there's a lot that we can talk about, but I'll end it there and to just say that it's nothing like we've ever seen in the country before. So the irony, Sanjana, seems to be that if crisis was the brand of the Rajapakshas, uh, it is crisis, in fact, which has uh, uh, served as a body blow to uh, the Raja, all that the Rajapakshas had built up. Uh, and, I, and I find that kind of ironical, but not surprising, come to think of it. But tell me, uh, you see, because, you know, if you look at the mainstream media, a lot of this narrative is missing. And do you think that the social media has now basically overtaken the mainstream media, both as, a, a, you know, a, a purveyor of news, uh, also, also disinformation? Um, so how much of the stuff which is coming out in the social media uh, is, is actually... Uh, news you in your view and how much of it is disinformation because it's not that only the Raja Bakshis would be indulging in disinformation. I'm sure there would be other players as well. Maybe not to the same industrial scale as the Raja Bakshis, but I'm sure others would also be peddling their own narratives out there. How is that dynamic playing out right now? Well, those are two, two questions intertwined and implicated. And uh, so the one, the second one I'll, I'll tackle first in as much as can be determined for the past decade, the Rajapaksas, and I'm going to say this again, have been primus inter pares. Any other disinformation campaign and the instrumentalization of weaponization of social media pales into insignificance around the investments that they and their proxies have made, both in the country and helped by outside parties as well, uh, to shape and mold social media to project, promote, produce, and propagate their version of politics, their political brand, and what they want to see as the future of the country, including shaping electoral outcomes, uh, both in the 2019 presidential election and around the 2020 general election. Uh, we have been a harbinger of what we have seen on both sides of the Atlantic in terms of the Brexit referendum and the 2016 Trump election. And that is recalling what Nobel Peace Laureate Maria Ressa said around her country, the Philippines, even before the most recent election, where the global south and countries like ours are the petri dish for what at greater scope, scale and speed are being instrumentalized and weaponized and used in the global north uh, and in western countries. So the Rajapaksas are really 
the ones who have uh, been the uh, the ones who have led the disinformation campaigns and the misinformation campaigns by far, not exclusively, but by far. And that has come to a grinding halt since the 27th of March, simply because the volume of content around the protest and in favor of the protest has drowned it out. But I have spent a lot of time over April um, around what I call the narrative corruption of the Rajpaksas trying to um, seed disunity and division amongst the protesters by seeding doubt, seeding violence, um, and, 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 and through other nefarious means uh, on social media to kind of try to break up uh, the attraction and uh, the appeal of the protests. The, the first question is an interesting one, and I would not really uh, distinguish between old, new, mainstream, traditional, and social media. It's all one thing, really. And it's the case in India, and it's the case in Sri Lanka as well. So, for example, I mean, for make it easy for viewers, I mean, a lot of people look at television content on Facebook, and that's called time-shifted viewing. I mean, you would look at it, my mom, for example, who's nearing her 80s, would look at it on TV. But my the rest of my family and my friends would look at it in terms of uh, edited segments that are subsequently put up by the television stations themselves onto Facebook. And that's what goes viral. So that's what generates the, the views uh, on social media or, or across a number of platforms. So um, it's not easy to distinguish between what is consumed uh, terrestrially or in print and what is on social media. So I just take it as an ecology, as a media landscape. And in that sense, what you're finding is that the people on the ground, wherever the protests are taking place geographically, are engaging in what's called acts of journalism. They are documenting the violence. On the 9th of May, for example, the tsunami of content that is now evidentiary material as well around what the prime minister instigated is coming from the people on the ground. It's not coming from journalists, actually. By the time they got there, everything had occurred and had been done, uh, you know, done and dusted. So there, there, are, there, there are hundreds of hours, thousands of photos, thousands of accounts, which are now, as I said, evidentiary material insofar as what happened from a ground truth perspective. Uh, and so that ground truth witnessing, the act of bearing witness, civic media, citizen journalism, and acts of journalism from the geographic spaces that the protests are taking place and those aligned to it. So you might not be at the... Uh, go to go home and the GGG at the golf face, but there are a plethora of people around the country who are engaging, who are talking, who are commenting, who are sharing. And that is just what is observable. It's also happening on WhatsApp as well. And so um, it's not as if I would, I would push back on the notion that journalism is unimportant, that people aren't tuning in. But let me bring another dimension to it. Uh, one of the things that has happened in the past month is that people are critically questioning one particular television channel owned by uh, individual who is a proxy of the Rajpaksas and has been, again, first amongst equals in pushing out, promoting, producing propaganda for the family and for the government, even when they have not been in power. This particular company puts out SMS updates, has a plethora of television channels, is into print and is into social media as well. And that narrative, that company and another company are being questioned as well. They have had a loss in followers, but more importantly, we're seeing a moment where, again, it's not perfect, but we haven't seen this kind of a moment where people are really questioning what is the narrative that we are looking at? Why is somebody saying this? What is, uh, you know, cui bono? Who benefits? Um, why is somebody saying that uh, what something is happening that we can't necessarily see ourselves? So uh, I hope it continues. And it, I think it's, a, it's, it's something that should continue and is bigger than the protests. Um, and, you know, you could say that social media has contributed to a sort of an awakening of a critical consciousness and a critical media literacy in the country that has never been there before. Uh, the longevity of it uh, may not be a given, but it is really good to see that as a consequence of the kind of content that we are seeing and has been produced, um, that is also interrogating its own narratives, we may have a population that is better able to determine when they are being fed with mis or disinformation into the future. So I am literally at the uh, end of uh, the time uh, which is allotted to us, but I think I can take out a minute each uh, for final comments. Uh, so Ambika, can I start with you? Uh, any final comments uh, uh, put on your 
you know, thinking hat uh, and tell us, do you think uh, Ranil Vikramasinghe is going to survive? Uh, how long will he be able to deliver? Uh, but you just have about a minute. So if you can just give us, then I'll go to Rehana and then Ambassador Prasad. Yeah, I think um, what is very clear is that the political class has failed the people of Sri Lanka. Uh, it is clear that the political culture in Sri Lanka is uh, corrupt. It is self-serving. It's dysfunctional. And the people are not willing to tolerate it anymore. They are questioning it. Uh, the, the road ahead, I can't predict because as you saw even today, it's politically volatile. And the main thing is that we cannot trust any of that. So in that sense, what do the citizens do? The only thing that we have, our ability to continue to protest, to continue to demand accountability, demand transparency, uh, which is what citizens are continuing to do and I think will continue to do. Uh, unless they see a solution, a viable solution, which is not this. And of course, the main demand to be met, that is go to go home. Thank you. Uh, Rehana, even if Gota goes home, uh, that doesn't solve the economic crisis. Uh, and whoever comes uh, into office after Gota goes home uh, will have to solve the economic crisis. Uh, do you think anybody has... Uh, you know, both the will and uh, the uh, playbook to solve this? Or do you think you will just stumble through this crisis, try and ward off a complete meltdown uh, and then set yourself up for the next crisis? Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, whoever comes, they're going to be extremely unpopular. I think this uh, sort of battling for who takes the mantle, it doesn't really make sense from any economic perspective because the things that you have to do are unpopular. You have to raise uh, full prices. You have to raise taxes. Um, I have seen the plans, uh, the emergency uh, stabilization and medium-term plans of the uh, main opposition, which is the Samagi Jana Balavega and the other some of the other opposition parties as well. Um, I think the SJB probably has the best overall, uh, most comprehensive plan for the economy. Um, and I mean, uh, if you take the uh, NPP, which is the other uh, opposition party uh, backed by the JVP, they, their plans uh, revolve a lot more around their, you know, usual ideology, which I don't think is uh, suitable or really going to address the structural problems in the country. So I think um, probably the SJB has the better uh, economic plan, in my opinion. Um, whether we can uh, you know, it'll all depend on how we go about this situation. Now keep in mind that you know, we have gone to the IMF, but nothing else has happened. Nothing really has happened beyond that. Uh, we haven't even hired uh, the legal and financial advisors uh, to work on the debt restructuring programs. There's a lot that has to be done. And, you know, the political stability is the key. Um, so I think, um, I mean, I, I don't know uh, where that situation will end up, but, you know, as you can see, I'm sitting in the darkness now because we don't have, we, we just lost power. So, uh, you know, I mean, this is going to be the reality of Sri Lankans for quite a while. Um, you know, I would have a, a guess, a safe, you know, a guesstimate at least, I think over the course of the next year is going to be very tough on the people. Rihanna, if it, if it makes you feel nice, uh, you know, 80s and 90s growing up in New Delhi, uh, we went through the same thing. So, I'm sure you guys will pull through uh, these power cuts and stuff. Uh, but Ambassador Prasad, uh, a final question to you, sir. Uh, now, India is in a bit of a pickle because if India uh, helps and assists Sri Lanka to whatever extent we can, uh, there are accusations that we are supporting the regime, which is deeply unpopular. If we don't do it, we see a friendly country uh, suffer, uh, the people suffer. Uh, so what do we do? How do we walk this tightrope? No, you know, I think it's pretty clear that of course we work with the government of the day. I mean, you know, that is 
what we are supposed to do. But uh, I mean, we keep in very close touch with all political parties, with all shades of political opinion. Um, I mean, this is absolutely no secret at all. We are uh, very close touch with all the parties. And I think our recent statements have made that clear that, you know, that the assistance that we are extending, whatever mm -hmm. we can provide, is to help the people of Sri Lanka. And uh, I mean, certainly there is a leadership thrown up by the political process, and you deal with that, you know, with that particular leadership. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we are not talking to the others and not aware of what. Um, you know, other parties think or uh, so on. I just wanted to say one word about Mr. Rani Vipin Singh that, uh, you know, in one sense, he has taken some pressure off President Gautabaya Rajapaksa. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a, you know, diverting things because now, henceforth, whatever, you know, goes wrong, what problems arise, they will be uh, sort of, in a sense, directed towards, uh, you know, Mr. Vikram Singh and whatever government he forms. So in that sense, I think some of the pressure uh, has been taken off. As I mentioned, I'm still not clear that how and in what way the public protest will translate into any kind of political, you know, change or process. That is not... It's not clear to me, and I don't have a sense of not being on the ground this too, you know. But it does seem to me that the protests, while occasioned by the shortages and the inflation and the difficulties right now, is also a protest against this growing authoritarian, uh, you know, system in Sri Lanka, the lack of a responsive government. And I think some of those issues will... Will, will, will need to be addressed at some point or the other. On the positive side, I mean, let me say that Mr. Vikram Singh is certainly is a very experienced uh, um, a politician. He has, he has dealt with international organizations. He is known to be somewhat, you know, pro-market, so that might help in some of the negotiations and discussions with the IMF. And we wish him all the best that uh, he will be able to bring Sri Lanka out you know, from this crisis. So, Sanjana, I was going to say any last statement, but any closing comments? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I, I any agreement with all of the all of, all of the all of the speakers, but you know, just to riff off the ambassador's point, uh, the protests are the reason why we are having a discussion on the democratic potential and future of the country. The protests have created a moment where there is pushback against an autocratic authoritarian government and a dictatorial um, family. The protests have created the space for the potential for democratic reform to take place. The protests have created a moment where all parliamentarians are being questioned. The protests are the reason why the Rajapaksas are being uh, are in hiding at the moment. They're not coming out. And the protests are the reason why the president is scared to open up his Facebook comments for the pushback and the feedback that he'll get from the public, while the prime minister isn't appearing in public, while uh, you know the family is in uh, not visible in the public domain anymore. Uh, and so there's a lot that we can thank the protests for, and one hopes that even in the future, in the months to come, as the Gota go home protests die out, and I hope with the fruition of Gota going home and being held accountable as well, along with the rest of the family, we see the foundations in this new firmament of a critical questioning and a citizenry better able to determine democratic outcomes and to push back against the kind of things that have instrumentalized their attention and their franchise to the worst of outcomes that we are all suffering from today. So I see I see hope, uh, even though Rehana is in the dark, which I think is a useful metaphor for what we will, as a country, have to endure. Uh, after dark does come light, and I hope that light does shine on all of us for for no fault of our own uh, as a country sooner rather than later. Uh, so I think uh, that's the best uh, place where to uh, end this conversation, because at least it ends on a note of hope uh, and. Uh, in these dismal times, I suppose that's the best we can do. 
So uh, really want to thank all of you. Really appreciate taking your time out for being with us. Uh, and and it's been a very enlightening conversation, uh, very enlightening inputs uh, coming from all of you. Uh, thank you all so much uh, and hope to do this again at another time. Thanks a lot.